Uh, hi, Naomi. Thank you so much for being here at PyCon Colombia 2018. Well, hello, and, and thank you very much for having me. It's really been a delight and an honor to be here. Great. Thank you so much for coming here. Um, so you have a PhD in classical languages. Uh, you did the, the also the bachelor degree and then the PhD. Uh, how, how a person that with such background ended up in technology? Well, for one thing, I think it's actually more common than, than some people expect. There are a lot of people in technology who've come from uh, humanities or language things. Um, but it was never my intention, honestly. When I was in graduate school working on my PhD, it was a long time ago and, and there was a lot less technology. And I remember up late at night talking, having beers with friends, and I argued that if I ever wanted somebody to write a computer program, I would pay them to do it. I was never going to learn this. <laughs> uh, but then um, I worked for a school, and um, it was hard to find people to fix the computers, so I thought, well, I can try to fix this. Uh, and so I started fixing things, and um, I wrote some programs to track student records and things like that. And before long, the school decided they could find someone else who, who could teach Latin, but they were having a hard time finding somebody to be director of technology. So that's oh. what I became. So uh, <laughs> that was, it, was, it was kind of a very slow, natural thing. But as I say, it, when I was young, I did not think I would ever do this. Yeah, that, that's a, a delightful story. I mean, you suddenly got the, the offer to say, hey, we would like you to be the director of technology. Well, I mean, it, it, it took some time to, to <laughs> get there, of course, but uh, I, I just experimented some with programming and I thought that this was, was fun. Um, as it happened, we moved, I mentioned before, I worked in Greece for two years. We moved to Greece and they gave me some money as, as a bonus and I was originally going to buy a car. Yeah. But when we got to Greece, Basically, the people in Greece kind of drive like they do here. Okay. And I thought maybe it wasn't so wise for me to drive <laughs> a car. So I bought a computer instead. One thing that I do when I program is that God bless internet. But how did you get the resources back then when you were learning how to fix a computer and how to program? Uh, there were books, it was the library. There wasn't nearly as much information but you know, you would go to the bookstore and say, oh, they got this, I've, I gotta buy this. And <laughs> so uh, I did a few years ago, get rid of a huge stacks of old computer books that were oh. known. So and, and mention about books, do you have any guilty pleasures, maybe for music or movies or more books, but not technology books, maybe other ones? Well, I, I will tell you one. Uh, and that is in the UK, in Great Britain, they have a, a TV program called Strictly Come Dancing, which is like Dancing with the Stars, except it's in, in the UK. Okay. So it's, yes, I, I, I watch that. And of course I have to get it via a proxy server because it's not supposed to be shown in the US. So it's oh. guilty, I, I, I am guilty. <laughs> um, but yes, so, so I, I, every season when that comes on, I watch that. Okay, that's great. What is your favorite movie? Oh, it'd be hard to decide <laughs> now. Um, Top three, it's fine as well, in case you have a group uh, of favorite movies. <laughs> yeah, um, when I was younger, I used to watch, um, I used to like the old Clint Eastwood movies. Those used to no. be so much fun. Uh, the, the movie that I most recently watched, which I thought was great fun, uh, is it's a very long two-part movie that is done in India oh. and it's called um, Bahubali and it's about this hero set in some mythical past who you know, goes through all of these adventures and whatever and they have just an amazing special effects and giant elephants and giant this and that. It's just, just great fun. I thought it was really entertaining. <laughs> some of the, the conference staff told me that you were sketching some things. When you were in the Py Python Software Foundation booth. Can you tell something about that? I, well, so um, I work for a company that supplies artist supplies. Okay. So I started working from, for them um, al almost two years ago, and it seemed to me that it was like just a great opportunity. 
And I always wanted to do things like that. Hmm. So I started, um, started working on sketching and I've done online classes to learn some of the basics. And I'm really interested in sort of more architectural and urban scenes and things like that. I find the shapes of buildings and things like that are, are sort of interesting. And so this campus is, is, is beautiful. There are lots of shapes and I, I, I love this place. I could, I could stay here all day trying to, <laughs> to draw. I'm not saying I'm very good, but I, I, I enjoy it a lot. Ha, have you ever tried painting? I mean, after a sketching, tried to? I've done a little bit with watercolor, but uh, I'm still, I think I'm still learning how to do line and form and things like that, so. Uh, do you have any painting that you might like us to, to check out? Um, you know, I, I, again, what I, what I find personally interesting now is um, what they call urban sketching. Uh, and there is even a, a website, uh, oh. theurbansketcher.com, that, that has all of these things. And people around the world will go and wherever they see something interesting, they will sketch it and they will post it. So okay. that's what I'm interested in right okay. now. Great. And uh, moving a little bit uh, to the, your professional background, um, we have seen that you have been a, a have led multiple technology teams. What have been the m most challenging situation that you have faced doing that job? Um, there, there are a couple of things. In general, the hardest thing to do is to lead a team if the upper management cannot set clear goals and expectations and keeps changing requirements and things like that. I think that's everyone's worst nightmare. You work for two or three sprints on this thing and they come back and say, no, 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 we don't want <laughs> we that don't thing want anymore. That. Do this thing. <laughs> uh, it's very hard to keep uh, team morale. Uh, I think the other thing personally that I've found uh, difficult and something I very much try to avoid now is if you hire the wrong person, then what do you do? You have to eventually have that person move on and that's a very, very hard thing. Yeah. Yeah, that, that's really hard. And also, for example, in, in startup, and in this moment, everybody wants to create a startup and the market moves really fast. So the requirements sometimes change a lot. Mm -hmm. And if you mm -hmm. don't do it, 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 will, it will fail, right? Right. So, so sometimes it's, it's needed, but at the same time, it's hard to... And, and there are different ways. If, if it's done for a reason, you can make the team understand that. So okay. one of the, the teams I led was actually, the philosophy was very much, we need to do this fast and be in the market fast. And it's okay to explain that to people then when they sign on, that this is what we're going to do, we're going to fail fast and change. But on the other hand, if they can't understand why, if there's no clear reason why, there's nothing that makes a team you know, lose morale and be unproductive faster than that. Yeah, that's true. And um, uh, have you, uh, have we saw in the conference there are, there was even a speaker that was very young, right? And we have seen that there was a, a lot of young people uh, getting into technology. Uh, what would you recommend for them? Maybe how would they benefit from joining groups, technology groups, and coming to this kind of events? Well, I think from my experience, one of the most powerful things that people can do to build a career or to build sometimes what people call a personal brand, that is, you know, the, the things that you do that you want to be known for that, that will attract people. Uh, being involved in the community for me has been at the heart of everything. Um, I gave talks at PyCon and, and was involved in the community. That led to being contacted to write a book. Oh. I, I wrote the book, became more involved in the community. I found my next job by way of the Python job board that the PSF runs. Um, I was contacted for my current job because of all of those other things that have added up over the years. So, you know, it, it's, there may be not one specific thing, but becoming, you know, involved in the community, meeting people, becoming known in it is, is just enormously powerful.
Yeah, Th there is a, an author that, that is called uh, Gary Vaynerchuk. And he says that uh, there are some things and some actions that you cannot actually measure. Like for example, I'm going to go to PyCon and get a race. It, it doesn't it work, doesn't that, work way. that way. But it's about building a name, as you mentioned, and th things start to come up and get better. Yeah, indeed. Yeah, great. Now that you mentioned the um, Python Software Foundation, we know that you have been in uh, the chair of board of director for a while. Uh, did you run for that post, or was a committee that named you to uh, do that? So I ran to be on the board of directors okay. of the Python Software Foundation. People uh, are, are nominated. In fact, um, when I first ran to be on the board of directors, it was partly because of the suggestion of Audrey Roy, who is also here. Oh, yeah. So they contacted me and said, you know, you, 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 you should do this. You really, you, you would be good. You should do this. And, and, and I did. Uh, being on the board of directors, again, trying to be active, I served as a vice chair a couple of times. And this was just, um, it's selected by the board. So they ask, who's willing to do this? And okay. so I raised my hand. Uh, then when it came time most recently to select a, a chair of the board, um, they asked, who's willing to do this? And I raised my hand and nobody <laughs> else did. So <laughs> that's how it happened. So it's uh, like a mixture. It's you posted and also you were elected because anybody mm. wanted to do it. Right. Well, I mean, it's, it's <laughs> people are afraid that it's, you know, they, they, that's a lot of work. So yes. um, I, I think a lot of people didn't feel they had the time, but I, I felt I did. So. Uh, and how, are, how does the P PSF work? How, how is the decision making process in the foundation? Well, that's, that's a good question. Uh, there are a lot of things that need to be done on a day to day basis, and that's what our employees do. Okay. So we have a director of operations who's very good. She's been working for us for uh, many years now. Uh, and we have um, a, a, a person who works on events and sponsorship. We have somebody who looks after infrastructure. We've got a couple of people who handle accounting. So, so they handle all of the day-to-day -day things and the, the, the board of directors lets them do their job. We should not be telling them how to do their daily job. But then the board, we meet once a month and we decide on larger issues, so strategy, direction, what the board should do. Is this particular initiative that people want to do, does it match our mission or does it not? Things like that. Um, we also then sort of make sure that the, the staff are achieving the things that we kind of set for them to achieve and things like yeah. that. So that's, that's how it works. We're, we're working to make that work better. We, we're learning, as if everyone is. Yeah, the, the Python Solar Foundation has been a great example for us, the community in Colombia. We have been learning a lot from you. And we wonder, what are the plans for the Python Solar Foundation during this year, 2018? Uh, well, I mean, I think a couple of things that we're looking at. Uh, one thing is that we <coughs> are uh, going to do a little bit more work on our code of conduct. Okay. Uh, Python Software Foundation was very early with the code of conduct, but it now, that means it now needs to be looked at and, and maybe revised and, and some thought put into how the PSF as a whole handles uh, code of conduct things, as opposed to a specific event. Suppose we get something that's more general. Yeah. So we, we are working on that. Uh, we are going to uh, continue <coughs> to work on um, building sponsorship and making the PSF more financially secure. Okay. Uh, so there are some things along those lines. And uh, in general, I think this year is, I, I don't know if it's exciting or not, but it's, uh, we're trying to do a lot more with board uh, training and training of the top people oh. in terms of best practices. So that's partly around code of conduct. It's partly around um, what you would do to make a, a, you know, business best practices for a nonprofit organization and things like that. So uh, a lot of that's what's going on. We also have um, the Moss Foundation grant for uh, infrastructure. So we received a fair amount of money from them to pay people to work on basically 
making things like PyPI and uh, bugs.python.org and all of those things work better. So that will be something the community will see as a benefit. Okay. We have seen that in during this year uh, on PyCon, will be held a uh, PyCon Charlas. Yes. What, what, what is that about? What was the reason you, was, you guys started doing that? So it's a little bit funny that um, the idea actually came from somebody who is from Brazil uh, who you know, talked to me at last PyCon and said, well, you talk about diversity all the time, but there's no language diversity here. Okay. And I thought about that, and I thought about that some more, and it's like, well, that's right. Yeah. So then I started talking to the Python software, or the, the PyCon organizers, excuse yeah. me, and I said, you know, is there any way we could try something? It doesn't have to be big, but can we try something? Yeah. And they're like, well, we'd like it to be fair. We wouldn't want to just pick one thing to do. So that's when we sort of talked some more and came up with this uh, hatchery program because pythons hatch from eggs. So that was the idea. So basically we came up with a structure that would allow any group okay. to suggest something that could be added to PyCon, to try it out, have a room for a day, see how it goes, come back and report on it. And if it's a success, maybe it becomes part of, uh, of PyCon regularly. So, um, I put out some tweets saying, would anybody be interested in helping on uh, doing charlas, talks in Spanish at PyCon? And as you might expect, a lot of people were interested yeah. in helping. Uh, so um, we have quite a team. We've got about a dozen people volunteering to, to help on this. Um, Co-chairs are uh, Mario Cochero, who this past year was the leader of uh, PyCon España. Okay. And um, uh, Mayela Sanchez, who uh, was uh, organized a um, Python Mexico. So they have really taken this on and um, we now have our, our call for papers open. It will be open until uh, March 26. Okay. Uh, we've got eight slots to fill and I, I know we're gonna have many, many more submissions than that. Yes. But this is good because even if we can't honor all of the talks, if we have so many submissions and we have people come to the Charles, this means that there will be no question next year that this becomes part of PyCon. So this is the goal, to make it so good that people who don't know Spanish will want to learn Spanish so they can go to the Charles. Right, I'm, very, I'm very excited for, for to, to attend to the conference and go to see how it goes. In fact, I'm going to submit Let's see if I make it. Absolutely. But, uh, still, I will definitely go there and enjoy the PyCon Charlas. And, <clears throat> and uh, as you mentioned, the PSF is very aware of uh, the, uh, the diversity and inclusion dialogue. And you, you are the champion. You are a champion on, on, on that dialogue. Mm, what would you recommend to the um, uh, min minorities that are, that are trying to make it into, in technology? It's, it's hard. Um, we try to make it easier, it's hard. I mean, part of it is that I think minorities who are trying to make it <coughs> in technology need to, on the one hand, they do need to be willing to take the risk and to do some extra things. This is, is unfortunate, but it's just the way that the world works. If you don't expose yourself to some risk, it's hard to get ahead. But on the other side of that, I think everybody doing this needs to be aware that it's a very hard thing and you need to take care of yourself. You need to, to honor the fact that what you're doing is hard and not, not blame yourself if it doesn't go, go well. Understand that it's going to take a lot of energy and you need to take care of yourself. So I think that's something that people don't, don't take into account as much. Um, it's, it, it is work. Yeah. Yeah, th that is that is so true. And for example, what we do in, in Django Girls Colombia, we we think that um, the people that, that is not considered my minority, we have a, a huge responsibility. For example, in Colombia, that is a male-driven society, and I, I, in my case, I feel a, a huge responsibility of of, of saying, okay, what what are we going to do that uh, to empower women through technology? And that's we m most of the organizer are men. Uh, but we are slowly um, 
uh, inviting women and some of them they say yes and if they say no it's completely fine they, they got the, the reasons but what we do is try to keep track and, and show them that we have done some good uh, events and workshops so yeah the, the, the key is both parties I mean the minorities and um, the non minorities to support and yes. to help a lot to put a lot of action and effort on that so yeah that's that's a great point that we are very proud and happy we are working on that yeah, in a smaller um, proportion but it's still doing something how do you see the future of um, the Python language in 10 years for example in, in my perspective I've seen that ten, uh, 10 years ago it was focusing one field it was web and now the academic community, the scientists, are, are most of the in the new people that are using uh, Python is most of them are in with a scientific background. So how, how do you think would be the next year for the Python language? I mean, I think there will always be a, a, a web community. You know, Python will always be <coughs> used for things like that. Uh, I think we also have a, a strong but maybe not totally recognized segment doing just system administration. It used to be when I started in Linux 20 years ago, Perl drove everything behind the scenes. Now, mm -hmm. almost everywhere, it's Python. Sure. So, so that will be there. But I think you're right that um, the, the two components that are likely to grow the fastest are going to be scientific computing for one, uh, because you cannot do a lot of research without handling a lot of data now. In order to handle a lot of data, you need to be able to code, you need to be able to publish your code so that people can you know, check to see if they're reproducing your results, all of those things. So I think that in the sciences, we're going to see a lot of, of growth. But then I think in data science, we're going to see the most growth. Okay. So in five to ten years, I think that um, we will have an increasing amount of, of things that are driven by data science. And that means we're probably going to have a lot of people who at least originally started out not being programmers who will end up in, in this community, which has happened before. I think that will continue to grow. Yeah, in a previous com conversation, you were, m you were mentioning the, um, the software carpentry. Yes. Mm -hmm. Uh, can you tell us something about that? Well, I mean, I, I'm not really an expert. I don't know much about it, but I know that uh, Software Carpentry is, a, uh, is an initiative to uh, teach scientists uh, some basic software development best practices so that when they go and, and, and do their processing of data, they have better and, and, and more reliable, more reproducible software that, that they use for that. You know, this, that's very different than what a lot of traditional software engineering yeah. is. Scientists are writing kind of one-off pieces of code for one purpose or something like that, uh, as opposed to something that's going to be sent out into the world. So yeah, yes. it's, it's they they can use those skills. Yeah, definitely. I mean, if they go so those ex skills, that will help the development process significantly. So yeah, and um, Naomi, thank you so much for me coming here to Colombia. It's my pleasure. It's it's been great fun. We hope you will visit our country again, maybe I in another PyCon. So let's see how it goes in the future. Indeed. Thank indeed. you. Okay. Well, thank you. Okay.